Coal has been powering Britain since the Industrial Revolution, but tonight the switch to greener energy sources will reach a significant milestone. It'll be two months since any of Britain's electricity was generated from burning coal. The change has been rapid. Just a decade ago, more than 40% of the country's electricity came from coal. Our chief environment correspondent, Justin Rowlatch, reports. It's these guys' job to make sure your lights stay on. This is the control room at the heart of the national grid. The screen behind me shows where Britain is getting its energy from right now. It's a mixture of gas, nuclear, biomass, hydro, wind and solar, but no coal. And as of midnight tonight, Britain won't have burnt any of the black stuff for two months, smashing the previous record. There are now just four coal-fired power stations left in the country. Why burn coal when you can get power from these? Just one rotation of this giant turbine can power the average home for a day. And these days, building new renewables isn't just about the environment. It's also about hard cash. The falling price of renewables is part of a fundamental shift in the economics of energy. What we've seen is essentially a halving of costs in a very short time scale, like in the last you know, five years or so. Britain's biggest power plant, Drax in Yorkshire, will stop burning coal completely next March. These days, most of the electricity the plant produces comes from these compressed wood pellets imported from America now because trees take up carbon dioxide when they grow and because new trees are planted when the forests are harvested it means Drax's net emissions have been reduced dramatically. We here at Drax decided that coal was no longer the future. Today we get about three ships a week that bring wood pellets into the UK. We use about seven million tons of wood pellets a year. It's been a massive undertaking and the result of all that is we've reduced our CO2 emissions from more than 20 million tonnes a year to almost zero. The coal era is not yet over, mind you. Elsewhere in the world, particularly in China and some other developing nations, governments actively support the industry. But here in Britain, the last coal plants are expected to close within five years. Justin Rowlatt, BBC News, Yorkshire. Well, joining me now is Bethany McLean, expert on fracking and oil. She's the author of Saudi America, the truth about fracking and how it's changing the world. And she joins me now from Chicago. And are you as surprised as many people here are at that fact that we haven't used coal for two months? Well, I'm, I'm not as surprised because the U.S. has seen that same dramatic transition um, in part in the U.S. as a result of fracking. As natural gas became cheaper and more plentiful, a lot of power plants here have shifted away from coal and toward toward natural gas. And we, we all know the world is moving toward renewables. It's just a question of the timing. Fracking, though, is not cheap, is it? <laughs> no. So my criticism of the industry uh, has always been, there's plenty to criticize environmentally, but my criticism has always been a, a financial one, which is that the industry simply doesn't make money. So it relies on uh, a continued inflow of capital from outside sources in order to keep going. It's not, it's not internally self-sufficient. You're, you're literally pouring money down a hole, aren't you? <laughs> yes, you were pouring billions of dollars into the ground, and thus far those billions of dollars have yet to come back up. <laughs> so at some point, does someone say, hang on a minute, we're going to lose? Well, no, because there have been lots of ways to win. Uh, well, let me break that into two parts. There have been lots of ways to win up until up until recently, um, because in the U.S., publicly traded fracking stocks were valued sort of like internet companies. Instead of being valued based on profits, they were valued based on how much oil and gas they were producing, regardless of whether that production was profitable or not. So, if you were and executives were 
paid based on production growth. So if you were an executive or if you were a private equity firm that was able to sell the company you'd funded to a publicly traded company or take your company public, you could make a lot of money, even though the underlying business wasn't wasn't profitable. That's changed as equity market investors have become a lot more skeptical, even before the advent of the pandemic. Ah, well, I was going to pick up on that because, Bethany, hasn't that changed everything in terms of how we view energy and, and our need for greener energy? It has. It has. It's unclear yet how. I mean, the, the obvious impact of the pandemic is that the collapse in demand for oil completely cratered the price. But you've had some resurgence since the lows of, of March, March and April. And and some skeptics are given given increased skepticism about China, particularly in the U.S., about reliance on China. If we stop importing, for instance, all of our solar panels from China, then some of the cost improvements that have made solar so cheap might might go away. And oil is likely to be cheaper than it was, which in the past has not been a great thing for renewable energy when, when fossil fuels have become cheaper. So I, I described it to somebody else once as like multivariable calculus rather than rather than like a linear equation to try to figure out what's what's going to happen next. And, and did they understand what you were saying? Because you've just lost me. <laughs> I'm sorry, the inner math major. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wonder about the role of politics in all this, because as oil fluctuates so, so dramatically, um, where, where do politicians stand on this? Because green at the moment seems a lot cooler, if you like, than, than oil ever was. Well, it, it, it for sure is, and it's for sure the way the world is going. So here in the U.S., if we had any kind of national strategy, you would think it would be oriented uh, around a transition to renewable energy, but the U.S. has never had a... a a, a, a national energy policy, so you can blame President Trump for that, or you can just say that's the way the U.S. the U.S. Has always been. Um, um, but that it certainly seems like that's the way the world the world should go. And uh, America, of course, the suspicion is, is still sitting on the largest reserve of oil without telling anyone else about it. Well, it's not so clear that we're sitting on a reserve of oil that can be extracted in a way that is financially viable. And so then the question becomes from a political point of view, does the government choose to support this industry because of its importance to America strategically? And oddly enough, especially in a, an election year, you would think the politics around that would be obvious, right? That the Trump administration would be supporting the industry with, with everything they've got. But oddly enough, they have they have not to date. There's been no explicit oil and gas industry bailout, despite calls from the industry for that very thing. And I thought that would be a fascinating thing to understand the politics behind that, because it's, 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 it's not what you would expect. Bethany, looking at what we've just been uh, reporting on and, and the UK being this change being so dramatic compared with just 40 years ago, uh, who's ahead on this? Is it the United States or is it the United Kingdom? It sounds to me like the United Kingdom is is ahead. It's a little bit beyond my expertise, but the U.S. is certainly not ahead. Um, if anything, I think the administration's pounding the table about energy dominance in the U.S. thanks to the amount of oil and gas we've produced uh, as a result of fracking has been a negative because it's priding yourself on being a leader in the world as it was rather than looking to the future and saying, how do we be a leader in a world where fossil fuels are irrelevant? Bethany, it's really good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Bethany McLean there joining us from Chicago. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, just want to bring you some uh, breaking news. Uh, just hearing, this is coming from Reuters uh, in Tokyo, saying Honda, the Honda Motor Company suspended some of its auto motorcycle production globally uh, as the car junk grapples with a suspected cyber attack. Uh, it affected Honda's production globally, forcing some plants to stop operation as the company needed to ensure that its quality control systems weren't being compromised. Now, Honda suspects that the ransomware hit the company's internal servers. Production resumed at most of the plants by, by now, but its main plant in Ohio, as well as those in Turkey, India, and Brazil, remain suspended as the uh, ransomware uh, disrupted the company's production scheme. We're hearing that uh, Swindon has also been affected by this attack. We'll have much more on this when we return in a few minutes. But in the meantime, let's look at the weather with Thomas Schaffernecker.
So there's not much change on the weather front uh, over the next uh, few days, often cloudy weather with uh, spells of rain, but also a few sunny spells. It's actually very difficult to describe uh, in a summary what the weather's going to be doing um, for the, uh, the rest of the week, because it will change from, from day to day. But broadly speaking, there's no real return to uh, summer weather on the horizon will be under the influence of low pressure and uh, weather fronts, which will occasionally uh, bring spells of rain. And in fact, one weather front moving into the northwest of the UK, so wet weather across Scotland, Northern Ireland, and then some of that wet weather will actually move into the northwest of England, the Lake District, and parts of Yorkshire as well. And at times it could be quite heavy, but to the south of that, it's going to be a mostly dry night, uh, around 10 degrees, I think, the overnight low tonight. Now, Wednesday itself sees weather fronts moving across the UK. Generally speaking, it is going to be cloudy most of the time. And then occasionally we'll see bursts of heavy rain, probably not lasting particularly long, maybe a couple of hours at the most. Uh, temperatures will be around 16 or 17 degrees. And actually later in the day, we'll see the weather improving across Western areas. Then come Thursday, that weather system is kind of going to sink a little bit further south the wind direction is going to change and it looks as though it's England and Wales that gets most of the cloud and the spells of rain on Thursday, whereas Scotland and Northern Ireland gets the best weather on Thursday. And the low pressure, which will be driving our weather for the rest of the, uh, the week and into the weekend, will be stuck in the Bay of Biscay. And that basically means that weather fronts will be circling around and in towards the centre of that low. And actually one such weather front is almost going to come back in on itself and sweep into southern parts of the UK. So on Friday, again, it's the south that could have some heavy rain here, whereas the best weather will be in the north. But also what's going to happen with this low pressure spinning around here, it's actually going to draw up some warmth, a current of warm and humid air and push that in the direction of the UK. So yes, often cloudy. Yes, the threat of rain and no prolonged sunny spells, but those temperatures are expected to rise over the coming days. Bye-bye. This is BBC News, I'm Simon McCoy. The headline